Today on Dead Dodge Garage, the Llama Barn Valiant is broken. It's like a jump box, but so much cuter. Yeah, the e-brake's on, which is great, except it doesn't actually do anything. Did you know that we sell Dead Dodge Garage merch at deaddodgegarage.com? Uh, well, we do, and the hats are even clean, so check them out. Oh, yeah. Power steering? Oh, this is too deluxe. Oh yeah, I forgot about the horrible noises. Is the clutch so heavy? Hmm. The gas gauge works? Now that I don't believe. I teased making a video on this car months ago after I did that video on my brother's 64 Fury, which was remarkably popular. It turns out people really like crappy cars with small blocks and four speeds. Of course, we're really into small blocks and four speeds around here. We put them in just about everything. Everything. Anyway, for whatever reason, it slipped my mind for a while there. The other day, I showed this car as a prop, an example of the kind of A-body build I'm into, in a video that also turned out to be pretty popular. It got quite a bit of attention. <clears throat> Hi, Tony. Anyway, I decided as a follow-up to that video, I should give you a closer look at this thing and show you a really great recipe for a budget, super fun A-body. It also happens to be broken though. See, if you know anything about Chrysler charging systems, you know that the voltage regulators are just a constant source of misery. Really? If you don't know anything about Chrysler charging systems, check out my video about classic Chrysler charging systems and you'll learn everything you need to know. Rather annoyingly, this 1967 Plymouth Valiant uses the earlier style regulator, there. And that means that the spare I have which a subscriber actually sent me. Super awesome. Uh, doesn't fit. I do have some other options available, but uh, we'll put a pin in that. More on the charging system in a minute. So, ah, there we go. What the heck is this thing? This is a 1967 Plymouth Valiant two-door sedan. These cars are pretty interesting. They actually share the roof panel, front glass, back glass, and other things with the four-door sedan, but they have a door that's the same as a two-door hardtop, although it does have a window frame there. There's a post here for rigidity and strength, and a roll-down back window also inside a frame. This is in contrast to a two-door hardtop or a pillarless coupe, like the Charger here, in which there is no center post, and when you roll the glass down, it's just one big opening. Unlike a two-door hardtop like the Charger or, you know, a Dart, these Valiants never had any sporting pretensions from the factory. They could be had with small V8s, but they were not go-fast cars. The low-line Valiant 100 series, especially, was intended as basic transportation. And that's it. In spite of that, an interesting thing happened. The two-door sedan, or post car, became very popular with drag racers because it is light. Yeah, this is the cheapest, simplest, lightest car that Chrysler made in 1967. Well, at least as far as I know. And it really lends itself to drag racing quite well. And of course, being on the A-Body platform, you could bolt anything onto this that you could bolt onto a Duster or a Demon or a Dart Swinger. Suspension, drivetrain, all that stuff. So when my brother, who is a very silly man, got his hands on this thing, that's exactly what he did. He took the entire running gear drivetrain that he had installed in his Duster and moved it over to this unit. Made for a pretty interesting car. Actually, to be more exact, what he did was take the ruined original drivetrain, K-frame suspension, rear axle out of this car, take the entire drivetrain, suspension, rear axle out of his duster, put them in this car, then take another complete slant six drivetrain, K-frame, suspension, rear axle, out of another Valiant and put that in his duster. Yeah. He does stuff like that. Pretty sure this engine was actually in his Fury at this time and the Duster had like a 318. I don't even know. He swappy swapped things so often, it just gives me a headache trying to think about it. On this episode, we take a perfectly good V8 out of this Duster and put in a slant stick. According to my brother, somewhere on some electronical device, there's a time lapse of all of this craziness happening. 
We can't find any of that, of course, but here's a shot of the poor man's body drop done in the back of our old shop. Oh, here's a really crappy shot stolen off of Instagram that shows the 318 that came out of the duster and the slant six going in. There's the poor Valiant sedan that gave its life for this project. It wasn't any good. Whose man is this? I do have some poor quality historical video. Let's take a look at that. Anywho, since we're back in here, I guess I'll walk you through it. This is a 1990 Roller 360 engine that I pulled out of a pickup truck in a junkyard. Instead of the original 308 heads, which I sold, it's wearing a set of Magnum heads. Notice the paint does not match on those. That's because this one over here actually cracked once so badly it got into coolant and this thing steamed like a choo-choo train. This was actually the only Magnum head I've ever seen crack that far, although they all have the little cracks between the valve seats. That's usually not important. It has a Hughes roller cam. I don't remember the specs. It's not one of the crazy ones. Very streetable. It has one of those dual bolt pattern eBay intake manifolds, and it has a set of the cheapest headers known to man. They're a glorified skid plate. Hey, how much daylight should I be able to see through the firewall? And then there's a big old carb spacer and a generic nothing special Edelbrock under there. Very simple. It's a sweet combination, and it is known to get more than 20 miles a gallon in this car. Oh wow, the throttle cable isn't broken currently. Usually those are held on with zip ties on his stuff. Over here, there's an HEI ignition module, expertly installed. And as you can see, there's actually a built-in backup. That's good thinking. Uh, there are some holes, but, you know, whatever. This car is called the Llama Barn Valiant because it came out of a llama barn. We used to call it the Horse Barn Valiant, until we found out about the llamas. Through the magic of technology, we've got some historical shots. Here's the Valiant in the llama barn. Here's the Valiant after the property owners dragged it out of the llama barn. Here's us dragging it out of the yard with my friend's Nissan truck. Woo Here it is back at home base on the trailer behind my old, old Dodge truck. Hey, that's me pressure washing it. Note the 72 swinger behind it. There's a whole story behind that. These were supposed to be competing builds, but it didn't work out that way. Ah, oh, here's a great historical shot. There's my 78 power wagon and an 80s flatbed I had for a while. This 67 only grill is really neat. It has been backed into a little bit, which isn't super ideal. Also on the not super ideal side of things, this. And he hasn't been able to find another one. Well, okay, he did find another one, but it came attached to a whole other Valiant. This is the second seat that's been in here. I think it was free. The back seat's actually really nice, but I don't think it's from a Valiant, and I don't think it fits right. This car sat in that llama barn for many years with a smashed windshield, a completely ruined slant six block just laying on the K-frame, and give or take zero floor panel. Okay, the floor wasn't that bad. As mentioned, there is some other rust in various places. You know, nothing major. Admire the original bumper stickers. Apparently this thing was driven by a little old lady. And of course there's this. This is actually a replacement dare sticker for the original. And it's starting to look pretty sad too. Dang it. For some reason he painted the dash black and lost the other excellent sticker that was on there. Oh, also, it's got like the fancy tough style wheel that really doesn't belong in here. The original paint really brings something to the table here. It's well seasoned, you know? The factory dog dishes really bring something to it too. The rears here are on cop wheels. Nifty. Also, it looks like this tire rubs. It's always the driver's side. Always. Anywho, let's put it on the lift and take a look underneath. Oh, it made horrible noises when it came off the ground. Mostly groaning. 
Anyway. Oh look, more rust and a Penistar. Do you know why these Penistar emblems are only found on the passenger fender of these classic Mopars? Well, I don't, I have no idea. Well, here's the first look under the Valiant. It's immediately apparent that these components have seen some stuff. This half-destroyed K-frame is actually an original slant 6K frame out of the aforementioned duster. It is converted with Schumacher mounts, which as you can see there, worked out just perfectly. Did I mention the horrible groaning noises? I actually kind of thought it was coming from poly bushings this whole time, but this car still got rubber lower control arm bushings. That's interesting. Did I mention that these cheapo headers are awful? Well, they are. And they rub on the torsion bar on this side and they leak everywhere. They've been well beaten, like really well beaten. This guy just drove this car to Oregon and back. Okay. I don't think this drive shaft is straight. If you noticed all the gear oil everywhere, it's actually coming from the front of the transmission, which is obviously not good. You know, I'm beginning to be sorry I looked. Uh, glossing over all of that, what do you see here? Subframe connectors. They're attached to a brand new AMD floor panel. It's even mostly attached to the car. Being a later K-frame, this fancy Hellwig sway bar actually goes through it. And it's joined by a three-way adjustable friend here at the back on this eight and three-quarter axle. I think these are still the fancy Hotchkiss leaf springs he had on the duster. Exhaust clearance is always a problem on A-bodies, especially when you don't have any hangers. It does have air shocks on here, which is an interesting choice. I don't know if that's for tire clearance or because these springs are like collapsed. Maybe both. I believe this leaky 742 center chunk is holding a set of 323 sure grip gears. Well, they used to be sure grip gears. Oh, it kind of does the thing. E-brakes being inoperable in my brother's cars, that's just kind of normal, but it's kind of odd. This one actually is all present and hooked up, still doesn't work. As mentioned in the other video, there's really nothing special in here. This is just stock suspension. I think it's got upgraded torsion bars, but I don't remember. It's got basic Monroe shocks, which could definitely use replacement, and that's okay. And it's got a factory type disc brake conversion. Nothing to see here. This car is actually pretty solid in all the places that matter. I think I'm just gonna put the blinders on and Set it back on the ground. Pretend I didn't see any of this stuff. All right, maybe I'll tighten the shift levers. Maybe. I don't think we'll be doing burnouts today, though. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. Oh. Let's just not look here. Or here, in front of the back bumper. Only the finest. Oh, yeah. About that four-speed behind the Roller Cam 360. It's, uh, made of iron. But it's actually a four-speed overdrive. And you can tell here by the way that lever is flipped upside down. Obviously, that's a big part of how this car gets really great fuel economy. That and the modest rear gear. Okay, time to put it back on the ground before I just start getting itchy and I'm forced to fix more things. So, about that voltage regulator. I found one. Probably won't work either, but it's worth a shot. Well, it's a no, gang, but... Someone on the internet told me today that sometimes if you just hit these, they'll magically start working again. Oh, that's funny. I made it work again by zapping the output of it with the power probe. Huh. Oh, wow, he actually got tabs. There are some sounds. Oh yeah, there are more sounds back here. There's no trunk casket. Oh, seat's gotten worse. Trunk key. Essential equipment for any classic Mopar. Anyway, I guess the question now is, what's it like to drive? It might be too short. No, of course, it, it doesn't move. Why would it? In theory, it's an A-body. Probably drives just like every other A-body. Can you hear the trunk lid knocking around? Yeah. Did I mention my brother recently drove this car to Oregon? Like two and a half hours each way? The brakes are quite good. Confidence. I like this 
early gauge cluster. I must say I'm absolutely shocked that the speedometer still works, but with the melting cable on the exhaust and all. The wheel adapter rubs on the column and makes one of the most annoying noises I've ever heard. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Everything's great. For some reason, this car gets cut off all the time. All the time. Way too much timing. Being an overdrive transmission, third gear is pretty much the last one that's useful in town. Also, being an overdrive, the gear ratios are kind of not so good. somewhere and I parked it in a bush. I'm gonna go ahead and back the timing off because that's bad. No! Oh. Why is that actually tight? Never mind, just had to try harder. Well that's better. There's nothing like all that horrible exhaust popping from the numerous leaks letting fresh air in. The shifter gates are not lined up, not even a little. There is some horrible intermittent vibration on D-cell. Probably the driveline trying to fall out. Yeah, the ride is interesting. I just noticed this big ridiculous air cleaner rubs on the hood. This is all seeming right. So, are we getting full throttle? Not even close. Well, maybe that's his fuel economy secret. Okay, really though, I know why. Um, the throttle is supposed to be hooked up here, roughly, so it gets full travel. That also explains kind of why this is like it is. Well, it's better. The secondaries at least start opening now. I would definitely admire this throttle hold-down bracket. It's an LA one that's been bent in several directions, and it's got random tube spacers under it. It works, but it's not ideal. Oh, I also learned that... The upper hose leaks if you put your elbow on it, so I just won't. <laughs> okay. <sighs> yep. It's restored. Important note, if you set your throttle cable up like this, with it clamping the plastic section, it's going to drag on the cable inside and make the throttle harder to press. It'll be all gummy and horrible feeling, and eventually it'll probably break. So be careful with that. some extra ponies in the stable now. Oh yeah, my brother also put this shiny new headliner in. Uh, it's not very nice, but it is new. Okay, that's more like it. It's amazing how something simple like a throttle cable way out of adjustment just robs a bunch of power.
Barracuda also stalled turning around right here, so. I guess that's a point for the Valiant. Parked it next to the Demon. You know, these cars actually share quite a bit. I mean, all the underpinnings are the same, but, uh, well, that door panel is exactly the same. So is this body line. Although, you know, the quarter's a little curvier on the Duster Demon body. This one's arguably more handsome, sporty and what have you. But the Valiant's kind of a neat looking car too. In a way, you can do all the same go fast stuff to this thing that you can to the Demon. And it costs, well, less. Like a lot less. Like, and I'm not kidding here, my brother literally paid a jug of used transmission fluid for this car, so. Hey, I think the starter's falling off. That's a typical Colin thing too. Maybe the demon comparison's unfair. So, we'll look at this. The sporty 67 Plymouth A-Body. The Barracuda. Unlike every single other A-Body from this time, this car does not share a door skin with the Valiant. In fact, every panel on this car is unique. It's got curves everywhere. I like this thing, which is a flying brick. But again, all the important mechanical stuff is exactly the same. And this car, substantially cheaper. I'm not saying I prefer the Valiant, I'm just saying. Yeah, it's just something about this thing. It's cool. Sleepers don't really exist anymore, but so you could still try and pass it off as one, I guess. Anyway, there you go, the Llama Barn Valiant. Hope you enjoyed this look at this crusty pile of loosely assembled scrap metal. I kind of did. As ever, thank you very much for watching. And remember, the world is round. A square don't fit at all. How did I get through this entire video without ever mentioning Mopar Action's green brick? I don't know. But it happened. Death you, baby.